Greetings in the name of the Lord to this online worship service for the fourth Sunday of Advent. My name is Pastor Matthew Jones, and I welcome all of you who are viewing, and especially those members of our church family, Sandwich Church of the Nazarene. I have a couple of special announcements for you, and uh, so I'll start by reminding you that on a week, um, next week on Thursday, December 24th, Christmas Eve, we will be having an online a combined worship service with Salmonach Baptist Church, and that will be posted at 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve. And so we just invite you to plan some time throughout that evening to view that with your family. And uh, so that will be made available at 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve. I want to also say thank you to all of you who have been faithful in mailing in your offerings and giving online. And we appreciate that uh, uh, our family is sharing the, the responsibility of paying bills and caring for one another. And so I, I want to say thank you for your faithfulness in that. All right, those are the two announcements that I wanted to make. And so I'll begin our time of worship by saying, peace be with you. Let's pray. Ever faithful God, through prophets and angels, you promised to raise up a holy child who would establish a household of peace and justice. Open our hearts to receive your Son, that we may open our doors to welcome all people as sisters and brothers, and establish your household in our time. Amen. Amen. We'll begin today by taking a few moments to prepare our heart, soul, mind, and now especially our bodies to spend time in communion with the scriptures and with God's people. Though we are apart, the Spirit makes us one. So I'm going to invite you, if you're able, to uh, find your feet planted on the ground, to find a nice tall posture through your spine. Again, we don't want to feel any pinching or pain or anything, but we want to find an attentive awareness in our posture. And so a tall all through the spine, all through the back of the neck. And uh, you can bring your chin down slightly and raise up through the back of your neck. And that will help uh, find that posture. Um, when you're ready, you can close your eyes. And what we want to do is work on bringing our shoulders down away from our ears. So we'll start by lifting our shoulders all the way up as far as we can. Let's bring them back and then let them go down. That will also help uh, open up across the chest and lift the heart forward. Let's just take a moment to become aware of our breath. Don't change anything, just notice. can sense that my breath breath is a little rushed today. So together, let's just take a moment to breathe intentionally and to receive that breath from God. Let's do that by um, placing one hand on our tummy and one hand on our chest and what that'll allow us to do is to feel where our breath is going. So let's take two big breaths and uh, our goal for this is to fill our tummy and so uh, try and keep the hand on your chest still as you inhale and see if you can move out, expand that um, uh, tummy and feel your hand move out. So we're going to take two big breaths and trying to fill all the way down to our tummies. So you can do this on your own pace or you can breathe with me, whatever works best for your body.
Now let's take two breaths and try to fill first our tummy and then add a second part to that where we fill up through our chest. So it'll be kind of a two-part breath. You can have a little pause between the two parts if that helps you think. And as always, uh, you can imagine that glass of water being filled. As water pours in, it fills from the bottom to the top. So let's take two big breaths like that. Go ahead and fully exhale. Then allow your breath to return to its natural state. We're reminded that our God breathes life into us. And so, Spirit of God, we give you thanks for your presence, for granting to us life yet another day. We give you thanks, and together we say, Amen. Amen. You can open your eyes if you haven't already. And I'll invite you to hear the Old Testament reading today, which comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11 and verse 16. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent, in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. An evildoer shall afflict, afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Amen. We allow this scripture to call us to a time of confession, a time in prayer together. Jesus Christ, our Lord, has come to lead us into a path of transformation, which we often resist. Come, let us return to his way, examining ourselves and silently confessing our sins to our gracious God.
God our Father, long-suffering, full of grace and truth. You create us from nothing and give us life. You give your faithful people new life in the water of baptism. You do not turn your face from us, nor do you cast us aside. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. Restore us for the sake of your Son, and bring us to resurrection joy in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's spend a few moments together in praise and worship. And we'll do this just like we uh, tend to do here. And that'll be by me uh, repeating this phrase, Triune God, we praise you because you are. And you at home, I invite you out loud to fill in that blank. Uh, this is a moment to give thanks to God for who God is. So I will say, Triune God, we praise you because you are. And you can speak out loud um, whatever you want to give thanks to God for. You also can uh, push, put down in the comments so that others might see and be blessed as well. So let's spend a moment in silence and then I'll call us into some time of praise and worship. Triune God, we praise you because you are 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 with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. The gospel reading today comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In here we hear the word of God to the people of God, and so we say, thanks be to God. Now, I want to say, here's what I want to say. I want to say, we can be like Mary. I want to say that we can be like Mary and bear God's presence within ourselves. 
I want to say that we can be like Mary and bear God's presence within ourselves and that we can give birth to that presence for the sake of the world. I want to say that we can be like Mary and bear the presence of God within ourselves and that we can give birth to that presence for the sake of the world if we only would be more obedient, more willing, more quick to say, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. But that's not the whole truth, is it? I actually don't know that we can truly be like Mary and bear the presence of God within ourselves and give birth to that presence for the sake of the world. I don't know that we can be more obedient. I don't know that we can be more willing. I don't know that we can more quickly say, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word, unless we first have heard a truth spoken over ourselves. So the first thing in the announcement to Mary is this. Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. That is the starting point. Everything flows out. Everything that is going to come will flow out of that pinprick of truth in the fabric of reality. Our best understanding today is that Mary would have been probably about 13 years old. That is absolutely mind-blowing to us. And that place and time, that would not have been unusual for um, a young woman like that to be married off and to begin uh, giving birth. But for us, because of the cultural difference, there's a startling reality there for us. But there's also the notion that Yes, in, though that um, maybe that age and um, time would not have been unusual for her, her to begin uh, participating in the creation of a family, there is a sense in which um, it is startling that God has chosen Mary, this young girl. And I think when we remember just how young Mary is, and who Mary is, the position she has in the world, those words, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you, become all the more powerful. And I want to say, just think about what it's like to be 13. What 13-year-old doesn't need to hear those words spoken over them? Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. That's the starting point of gospel truth, especially for young people. I remember I saw a movie about this young girl who would have been about 13 years old. And throughout the course of the movie, you're, you're ushered into her mind and into her situation and all the struggles and very difficult things she's dealing with within her family and within school and social pressures and anxiety and, and the implications of social media for young people and expectations and she's to be honest she's having a rough go of it and it's, sometimes it's hard to watch because you can just feel that anxiety along with her of what it's like to be a 13 year old there is a scene near the end of the movie where she's with her father her only parent who she keeps pushing away and eventually she lets on to him that uh, the reason she's pushing away is because she doesn't want him to be ashamed of her. And they're gathered around this fire. And he says to her, I could never be ashamed of you. You are my daughter. And that is enough. I'm proud of you just because you are my daughter. What young person doesn't need to hear that gospel? But here's the truth. <laughs> it's not only 13-year-olds that need to hear that gospel truth, right? Do you know who else needed to hear that gospel truth? Jesus. 
yes, Jesus himself needed to have that be the starting point. Think back on Jesus' baptism. What happens? He goes, he gets in the water with John, he gets all wet, comes up, and what happens? A voice, depending on which gospel you're reading, either you know everyone hears it or just Jesus hears it. But the voice says, You are my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So this moment, beginning moment for Mary, is not just some unique thing that will start with her. It will also be the, the moment that will propel Jesus forward. I mean, out of the waters of baptism, he goes into wilderness, right? From then on, he's going to go into ministry. And where is his ministry leading? It's leading to uh, the cross. So the starting point for all of that, whether it's Mary bearing God's presence within her and birthing that for the sake of the world, or whether it's Jesus getting out of the waters, going to the wilderness, going through the land, inhabiting the land of the people, and then going to Jerusalem to a throne, not a throne in the palace, in David's palace, but instead uh, he makes a new throne for David, a cross. And it is in dying that he's raised and then he is exalted to the highest place that no Davidic king has ever uh, inhabited before. All of that begins out of this moment. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. That's where it all begins. So I was reading uh, an Advent devotional, Advent Meditations, by Richard Rohr, a little book called Preparing for Christmas. I want to read to you just a brief passage um, because he's talking about just this. It's in a chapter uh, called Self-Image. This is what he says. Who we are in God is a much more enduring and solid foundation. I always say that I will take God's kind of judgment of me any day over my usually harsh judgment of myself. I will take God's image of me any day, which is always patient and merciful, over my neighbor's rashly formed image of me. God always sees his son, Jesus, in me and cannot not love him. See John 17. This is a solid and enduring self-image. No up and down anymore. When I started in ministry in the early 1970s in Cincinnati and worked with young people, it seemed like I spent most of the time trying to convince teenagers that they were good. They all seemed to endlessly hate themselves. Later I saw it with adults too, whoever for, who forever doubted and feared themselves. They had to spend much of their energy, to use the American phrase, trying to feel good about themselves. Their self-image was based on mere psychological information instead of theological truth. What the gospel promises us is that we are objectively and inherently children of God. See 1 John 3. This is not a psychological worthiness. It is ontological, metaphysical, and substantial and cannot be gained or lost. When this given God image becomes our self-image, we are home free and the gospel is just about the best good news we can hope for. I'm convinced that so much guilt, low, negative self-image Self-hatred and self-preoccupation occurs because we have allowed our Christian people to be at a home to be at home in a world to take their cues and identity from a world that Jesus told us to never take as normative to begin with. As John says, why do you look to one another for approval instead of the approval that comes from the one God? So many of us accept either a successful or negative self-image inside of a system of false images to begin with. This will never work. 
We must find our true self hidden with Christ in God, as Paul says in Colossians 3. Or as Teresa of Avila put it, find God in yourself and find yourself in God. Then we do not go up and down, but we are built on the rock of ages. That's gospel truth. Young people, old people, everyone in between needs to hear that. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. So on Wednesday night, uh, we gather on Zoom and we spend some time in some sort of study and then we talk about some projects we have going on that are trying to engage in the work Jesus is calling us to do. And we spent uh, this past Wednesday night three minutes in silent prayer at the beginning. And um, I just have to uh, tell a little brief story here. As we're sitting in that silence, um, Angie, I think, snuck off and, and grabbed little baby Olivia and was holding little baby Olivia, who's just a handful of weeks old at this point. And... Um, as we're sitting there in the silence, I'm, you know, taking this very seriously and my head is bowed. And we just heard the faintest little coo from baby Olivia. And it was an involuntary reaction on my part, but a, fought, a smile just shot up across my face. Just at hearing this tiny little coo from baby Olivia, my whole face lit up. And then I had a moment where I had to say to myself, what makes you think that God has any other response to you, Matthew? One little coup can put a smile across my face. What makes us think that God has any other disposition towards us. We also, on Wednesday night, we read a prayer. And as we read it, I realized this is exactly what we need to be praying these days when we think about this text for the fourth Sunday of Advent. This is a prayer written by Ted Lauder in his book, Gorillas of Grace. Hear this. Holy One, untamed by the names I give you. In the silence, name me, that I may know who I am. Hear the truth you have put into me. Trust the love you have for me, which you call me to live out with my sisters and brothers in your human family. Amen. So on this, the last Sunday of a very odd Advent, let's start back at the very beginning. So hear this wherever you are. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Amen. It's now our privilege to spend a few more moments together in prayer, prayers of intercession. When you hear me say, in your mercy, you can reply, Lord, hear our prayer. We seek you, Lord, while you may be found. We call upon you while you are near. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You comfort us as a mother comforts her child. We pray for ourselves and those dear to us.
In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You are God of astounding promises. We pray for our community and for our neighbors. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Your peace guards our hearts and minds. We pray for the church in all places that we may know the freedom of life in the Spirit. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You cause righteousness and praise to spring up. We pray for the world and for all who care for creation. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We offer you other concerns we carry in our hearts. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Incarnate God, you fill the deepest blue of world and soul. Help us to claim the sturdy hope that Mary held in her heart and sang out in witness that we too may rejoice to be disciples of the one coming as dawn from on high. We pray this in his name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to receive this benediction. May the God of peace sanctify us entirely, and may our spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls us is faithful and will do this. Amen.
Go in the peace of the Lord, dearest favored ones, for the Lord is with you.